A wise man once said, you can't go wrong with a B&M hyper. The same wise man then probably went on to compare the B&M hyper to a cream brulee with cinnamon sprinkles and caramel drizzle. If you watch Theme Park Crazy, you know what I'm talking about. If not, I already lost you and this video just started. So let's get down to business. B&M hypers are some of the most popular coasters out there. They are pricey and only available to large chain parks. But if you can afford one, you have to get one. They fit on skinny plots of land, have amazing capacity, and deliver smooth and fast rides without a ton of intensity, but with a ton of floater airtime. They're crowd pleasers. And even though some enthusiasts may say they're too mild, I love what they have to offer. There are 10 in North America, and I've ridden all but one of them, and I'm ready to rank them up. These are North America's B&M hypers, from worst to first. The one hyper in North America that I have not ridden is all the way up in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. This is Goliath at La Ronde. This is the smallest B&M hyper on this list. The only one with a height that does not crack 200 feet, checking in at just a little over 170 feet. The layout is also very repetitive. Big airtime hills, a turnaround, and then smaller airtime hills. I'm sure it's a lot of fun, but its size and layout lead me to believe that even if I rode it, it would be last on my list of B&M hypers. So I'm putting it at number 10 for now. If you've ridden it and have a higher opinion, let me know. I also heard that the ops really staple you on this, which is a shame. These were built for airtime. Let the airtime happen. Number nine, Apollo's Chariot at Busch Gardens Williamsburg. Two years ago, this would be all the way up at number two on my list. This was the first B&M Hyper I ever rode back in 2008. I was late to the party, but for some reason, B&M Hypers in North America are all east of the Mississippi River. So it wasn't that easy for me to get on one before then. My first experience with an airtime machine like Apollo was glorious. And I had those amazing memories of my first B&M Hyper for 11 years. Thus, Apollo was in my top 10 and my number two Hyper. But then I came back to Busch Gardens in 2019 and I rode it three more times and I was super disappointed. Full disclaimer, it was a cold day in April and I'm sure the ride was running super slow, but I was disappointed in all those airtime hills. The floater was weak at best and non-existent at worst. The first drop off that pre-drop was especially disappointing, since there's another hyper that's much higher on this list that gives some wild ejector with the same element. And I didn't get that much this time around. It does have a great setting between the trees, and it's still my favorite coaster in the park, but I had to drop Apollo big time in my rankings after these disappointing rides. I owe it some warm summer rides, but until then, it's the weakest one that I've ridden. Number eight, Candemonium at Hershey Park. I had high hopes for the newest B&M Hyper, but I didn't love it as much as I thought I would. But just like my 2019 rides on Apollo, my 2020 rides on Candemonium came on a cold and kind of rainy day. I do know that Skyrush was running slow that day because I have ridden it on a warm day in the past, so I'm sure that Candemonium was not at its best. Still, the elements didn't really bother me at all. I thought that what it had delivered some great airtime, especially that first Camelback that had some crazy sustained air. My issue was with the length, the speed hill is really the last strong element, because after that, there's an upward helix, a twisted dive downward, a trimmed airtime hill, and then the finale around the fountain. That finale looks great to the people watching the coaster, but when you're riding it, there's not much to get excited for. So Candemonium is on the shorter side when it comes to track length, but it's also basically half a ride. The first half is really great, but the second half could be so much better. I still owe it some rides on a warm day with a full train. Number seven. Behemoth at Canada's Wonderland. A lot of people think this should top the list. I did not have the best rides on it. It didn't help that on all four rides, the ops were staple happy. But regardless, this coaster is very similar to Goliath at La Ronde. Airtime hills out, a turnaround, airtime hills back. It does end with a helix down, then a helix up, and then one more airtime hill for good measure. Not the most creative layout, but still pretty well-rounded. Maybe if I rode it again with a little more room, I'd be more impressed but I always thought of this as a lower tier B&M hyper since I wrote it in 2018. Number six, Intimidator at Carowinds. Here's another one that I always heard was at the top of its class when it came to hypers. My first two rides in 2018 were pretty average. The trims were hitting hard and it crawled through its course and that swooping turn at the end kind of seemed pointless. It's a pretty similar layout to Behemoth, except this is L-shaped rather than the more straight out and back layout of Behemoth. 
so it features that one curvy drop after the first drop. My rides in 2019 were much better, even with the cold weather and empty park. So I'm not sure what changed, but it seemed to be running faster or the trims weren't hitting as hard, so I pushed this ahead of Behemoth. Though if I rode these two again, I may flip them back. Those two are similar in so many ways. Number five, Goliath at Six Flags over Georgia. I remember when this would be criticized for not being a real hyper, and I guess it's not, since it stands 200 feet tall, but the drop is only 175 feet. But what it does with that drop is what puts this in the upper tier of hypers. I love how this coaster leaves the park, goes over the road going to the park, and keeps tossing you out of your seat in the grassy area next to the park, before going into an intense downward helix to turn itself around, ending with a bunch of small and powerful airtime hills. The kicker seems to be that last airtime hill right before the brakes, which gives you one last jolt before the ride ends. So it does have a different layout with the novelty of leaving the park. It has possibly the most intense moment on any B&M Hyper with that helix. And those small airtime hills at the end are kind of unusual for B&M Hypers. There's nothing conventional about this one, and I like it. I found this to be very similar to the next coaster on the list. Number four, Nitro at Six Flags Great Adventure. I think this is the most hated on B&M Hyper of the bunch, and I don't understand it. I've always had really strong rides on it, and I rank it really high. But I think maybe El Toro is taking some of its shine away over on the other side of the park, and its new neighbor is not going to help either, the RMC Raptor Jersey Devil Coaster. It has a very similar first half as Intimidator, just the mirrored version, but then it splits off and goes into a long, intense upward helix. I think this is the most intense moment on any B&M Hyper, more so than Goliath's helix. The finale is also very good. Where coasters like Behemoth and Intimidator have one last hill before their twisty sections, Nitro has four drops of different sizes, the last one being the biggest and the most jarring. Nitro deserves way more credit than it gets. On a hot day with a full train, it's easily a top tier hyper. My 2019 ride on a cold night wasn't as good, but I've ridden it enough to know how strong it is. Number three, Raging Bull at Six Flags Great America. It's been over seven years since I rode this for the first time, and it's been a top tier coaster for me this whole time. This one is a lot different than the others. It's a twister layout instead of the standard out and back model with lots of camelbacks. This leaves it open to get whacked by the critics, and I get that. There is a lot more turning on this coaster than the others, but I don't think that's really a bad thing. It makes for a much more diverse and creative layout, but still with amazing elements. Start with that first drop. We talked about how Apollo's Chariot's first drop fell flat. Raging Bull's first drop in the back row has some of the best ejector you'll find anywhere. It's the kind of ejector that'll fling you out of your seat and then keep you there the whole way down. It's one of my all-time favorite elements. Raging Bull also has another spectacular drop off its mid-course brake run, something you have to experience in the back. After those two elite airtime moments, there are a few other good airtime hills or drops off turns, including one unfortunately trim camelback, and it ends with a long twister section. Even if it doesn't have repetitive airtime moments, it's a long, complete ride with enough airtime to make it worth your while. Unlike another Hyper Twister that it often gets compared to, there's no contest here. Raging Bull is one of my all-time favorites. Number two, Mako at SeaWorld Orlando. I think most people would hold this as the best B&M Hyper in the country. And for me, it's close. I think it's comparable to Candemonium in many ways. I saw a thread on Reddit criticizing me for comparing them yet putting Mako so much higher on my list. It's true that they both have an amazing camelback, a speed hill, and a twisted ending. Candemonium is 10 feet taller and three miles per hour faster. But when I rode Mako, it was hot and the train was full, as opposed to the half full trains on Candemonium on a cool rainy day. Mako also has eight row trains. Candemonium only has seven. Does one extra row really make a big difference? On Raging Bull, it absolutely does. So I wouldn't rule it out. I also think that the Twister finale on Mako is better than Candemonium's finale around the fountain, but this is a minor point. Mako also has a slightly better setting on the lake, but again, minor detail. I felt like the airtime was stronger on Mako throughout the whole ride, and it could have just been the conditions the day I rode it. I got 10 rides on Mako, but it was all on one day two years ago, and of course my three rides on Candemonium were also on one day. This could all change in the future, but for now, Mako is in my top 10, Candemonium is not. Number one, Diamondback at Kings Island. For me, this is the gold standard of B&M Hypers. It has the same staggered 32 rider train that you find on Behemoth and Intimidator. I think these are kind of ugly, but they are super long, which means that you get all that whip in the back row. Unlike those other two, Diamondback has a unique layout in the woods. 
It's not just an out and back layout with a little helix at the end. It takes a left turn before its hammerhead turnaround, and then heads back the other way before heading back towards the station with more airtime hills, capped off with an awesome splashdown. The airtime on Diamondback is different than the others. It feels like you're out of your seat for multiple seconds when you're coming down for every one, and then it slams you back down into your seat. This is real, strong, awesome airtime. Candemonium and Mako have those 5 second airtime hills that Diamondback is missing, but Diamondback has more quality hills than any other hyper out there. It does have a rattle, and a nasty trim break, so it isn't perfect. And each time I ride it, I feel like I walk away less impressed than before. But for now, as we stand here at the end of 2020, Diamondback is still the best one here in North America. That's a wrap for the North American B&M Hypers. Let me know which ones you've been on, and how you would rank them up. All of these are pretty similar, so I can see someone's list being completely flipped over. And if you've ridden any B&Ms overseas, let me know your experience with those down below and let me know how they may stack up with the ones here in the US and Canada. If you enjoyed this video, please drop a like. That's the best way to show your support for the channel. And if you're new here and want to see more random rankings like this, please consider subscribing. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you all next time.